when you put together a book, it's really easy, I think, to become very myopic and think about the, the details, because the details matter and they're important. But I think every so often you need to zoom back, you zoom out and kind of step back and, and look at the thing as a, as a cohesive, holistic sort of endeavor. Um, so Minhi will talk us through that. Um, thank you, Minhi, welcome. Thank you, Yunja, for defining what a narrative is, because I think this part of the talk is um, the more sort of subjective and um, I guess loose uh, angle of the discussion of designing a book. So I really thank Ben and Laura for getting really deep into all the technicalities of um, book designing. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't have a TOC for my talk. Uh, despite <laughs> and um, so, uh, but I have six parts in this um, lecture, and uh, I will begin and end by talking about my work. And in between, I'll show you a lot of examples um, that can illustrate things you can do as a designer and editor to craft your story. Um, so, according to Google, I looked this up, but. Um, uh, historically, storytelling by humans were first done, um, was first done over 36,000 years ago in the form of paintings um, as found in La Squire Cave in the southwestern part of France. So that means storytelling came before humans learned to read and write. Um, and as dramatic as this sounds, that means also storytelling is essential to the survival of the human race and to pass on lessons and for humans to evolve. And so having a narrative is especially important also the making of creative work, whether it's art, architecture, film, fashion, uh, theater, dance. Um, so when I talk about making a book as narrative medium, I want to emphasize that designing a book is really about telling a story um, and that hopefully you can see this exercise as more than um, a representation of your work. So I want to share this quote with you by Derek Birdsell. He's a British graphic designer who's known for designing a lot of books over the course of his career. Uh, I found this in the introduction text of Notes on Book Design, which I also highly recommend as a reference book for book designing. Um, he says, I believe there is such a thing as a natural optimum layout for a book. The design is not inflicted on the content. It is derived from it. The precise placement and sizing of pictures and text seems completely natural and enforced. At a glance, the structure of the information on each spread is clear and unambiguous. The layouts appear to have designed themselves. So, and later on he goes on to talk about how it's more important than ever for designers of books to be um, very vigilant to the content of the book because back in the day at, uh, with printers, um, there used to be someone who would read through uh, the book before it went to print, and nowadays we don't have such uh, people doing that. So designers really have control of the whole process from the beginning to the end um, and have to be really vigilant. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about this project that I worked on uh, with Wax Studios, a design studio based in Brooklyn, New York. And it was for um, an Italian furniture brand called Arper. It's based in Treviso, Italy, and um, it's been around for multiple generations, owned by a fa uh, family, and their designs are very uh, minimal and modernist in a way, and they're very you know, intelligent use of material and a really sensible use of color as well. Um, they actually design furniture for all kinds of spaces, like um, the home, office, pub public spaces, like restaurants and schools. Um, so their whole collection of furniture include like chairs, furnishings, tables, um, sound acoustic boards. And um, so Arpa as a brand, their, their ethos is um, the, it's that essential forms can be versatile too. So essential is the key word for the brand Arpa. And um, this project was done back in 2015, 2016. And um, Rack Studios was asked to design a brief, which is basically a short book that would tell the story of the brand in a very clear and compelling way so that in the end when the book gets made, it would be disseminated in places like, you know, Arbor showrooms located in different cities around the world, or at design fairs like the Salone, the Mobile, and um, Milan, Italy, and other design fairs around the world. So, um, so we had to work with the word essential, and, um, after, and we worked with the strategists at 3x4 who were um, responsible for coming up with the strategic you know, framework of the brand. And, but in terms of the creative storytelling, um, you know, after brainstorming with the teammates at uh, Wax, um, you know, the challenge was to come up with a, a visual way of talking about essential. 
in a way that would connect to people in, in an emotive way. So for me, when I think of furniture, there has been one image that really left a strong impression on my mind. And it's this photo essay that Bruno Munari did back in 1944 for Domus magazine. And apparently at that time, um, designers for furniture were uh, designing and inventing for invention's sake. So they were not uh, designing furniture that would meet the needs of humans. So he sort of made this provocative photo essay where he positioned himself in different uncomfortable uh, postures with the same chair. So it's a very strong reaction um, uh, in terms of you know, like, uh, the ease of being in furniture. So that, I think, so the, this, that image was also a starting point for um, all of us kind of getting excited about the idea of telling the story of essential through the, um, the lens of human uh, ease within the world of furniture. So, um, so basically the idea is, okay, let's you know, bring humans into this world of furniture and tell that story in a more emotive way. And so we did a whole uh, image exploration for um, a while and we, it felt like you know, we left no, no, stone, no stone unturned in this process. We looked at like fashion magazines, campaigns, artist books, um, regular books, uh, fast, like blogs, photo blogs. And um, we were looking for gestures of you know, sort of like everyday human gestures, just sitting, people um, leaning over, uh, hands touching each other, um, legs folded on the couch. And we try to avoid you know, gestures that were not relatable, like acrobatic moves or like dance moves or high fashion poses. And so we really amassed hundreds of images through this research. And um, this inspired this, uh, you know, the actual art direction process for this book. So the frame, it's a really short book actually, but um, we had a clear structure for how to develop actually new content. So it, it wasn't even about editing, it was actually about creating new images for the book. So luckily, Arbor has, um, at that time, had a really nice collection of imagery of their own furniture shot by um, Shelton Evans and other photographers. So our plan was to pair these images that art, wax studios with art direct of humans engaging with each other or furniture with images of Arbor furniture. Um, and then just to show you, the, you know, a, a, a map of the six core chapters of this art book, book um, these six chapters were based on the six core concepts that were very important to the brand. And I'll read them out loud now. So it's balance, color, intuitive, play, light, and family. And so under the word essential, these were the six concepts under which they would, the brand would talk about um, their values. And in a way, you could see these values as, you know, values and metaphor, like metaphors for life values. Uh, so that's what I find ni found nice about the whole verbiage of, you know, all of this. And um, so the structure works with, you know, it shows each chapter basically starts with text openers, and we work with the writer to come up with short paragraphs, you know, talking about each of the core concepts. And then we, we follow each text opener page with three spreads of image pairings. So this is to show you an example text opener page, um, in this case for essentialist balance. And then we have the text on the right side in um, English, and then on the right side is to Italian translation, uh, because it's, um, the audience for the book was mostly Italian, um, given that it's an Italian brand as well, too. Um, and then just following up with the three spreads of image pairing. So as with typical art direction projects, the, these images were planned uh, you know, very precisely in advance. So we knew which furniture image we would pair with uh, the, um, the human images. So uh, the gestures that um, we planned ahead of the photo shoot, it was a, by the way, it was a photo, two day photo shoot at the Arbor Showroom in New York. Um, and then we worked with a local like Brooklyn-based photographer and the stylist, um, who else, like a producer. It was just like a, you know, a nice, like a typical photo shoot with all these different players involved, but on a much uh, smaller scale. And so anyway, so the images were really planned in advance and um, the gestures were inspired by some of the research that we did with all the images of human gestures. So like, you know, the idea was to create nice visual compositions 
uh, with these image pairings, but to also clearly convey the concept that was that on discussion in that particular chapter. Um, some of these just the more literal, because essentialist balance. And then I'll just show you a few more um, spreads that I personally liked. Um, this is from with the color is essential chapter. And color is, um, was one concept that was extremely important to the brand. So uh, I'll show you, after, so this was from play is essential. And because uh, color was such an important concept to um, our creative director at Arper, uh, the whole notion of color was not just about, oh, hey, our furniture comes in all these different colors. Um, they felt really strongly about communicating the notion of complexity of color as well. So that color can be simple and complex at once. Um, and then more, a couple more spreads. Um, this is also from Play is Essential. And then two more spreads from like Family is Essential. So um, the sum of parts you know, transcends into something greater. So yeah, and then in the end, we had this overview um, of all these image pairings. And what was nice about this was, like I said before, it was um, just one of those rare instances as a designer where we're not just taking content from a client, but, all, but we get to create the content ourselves. And um, we worked with the writer, strategist at 2x4, we worked with photographer, makeup artist, stylist, so it was like really comprehensive as an experience. Um, and in the end, uh, I think we were pretty pleased in the sense that we humanized the story of um, a furniture brand. And then I'll just show you one more spread where um, in the back of the book, there, there was actually a gatefold of an overview of all the furniture collections and then more text, uh, translations of the paragraph text uh, in other languages like Spanish, French, and German. Yeah, so next I'm gonna to talk to you about beginnings, which, so this is the, here I'm gonna show you a lot of examples of the more practical things that you can do as a designer. And um, this chapter is not so much about like the cover design of a book, uh, they say don't judge a book by the cover. But um, they, it's more about the TOC actually, and Ben did a really good job going very deep into the design, the different typologies of, of TOC designs. But um, when you move past the front door, you know, I think people just appreciate really strong sense of wayfinding. And uh, having a TOC is something that we, like Ben said earlier, we take for granted. But when you see, when you come across books with TOC designs that seem thoughtful or just well designed, um, it's evidence that the design or editor were you know, a little bit more vigilant about the content. Um, abstract, uh, I'll start with this example um, with abstract because the, it's, a, it's actually a book with a lot of information and a lot of different kinds of information. And what I like about it is that the YWO binding allows uh, the book to be uh, organized into different content uh, sections um, by theme. And the cover repeats itself, so the TOC appears in the back side of the cover, and then the, the frame around that particular section acts as a wayfinding device. So um, I think Ben showed this example earlier with a previous version of Abstract. And actually, Yunja gave a really good talk about this project a few years ago, and um, I recommend watching it because it's a really good example of um, again, the process from uh, content informing the form and materiality of the book. And then here you see behind the, the salmon pages, like section D is outlined. And then I Am A Camera, this book is a uh, exhibition catalog for um, a photography exhibition at the Satya Gallery and it was designed by Graphic Thought Facility. What I like about this book is that, you know, you know as an object it looks really nice and um, and the front cover it just got this nice image with two kids on a beach, and it doesn't seem anything out of the ordinary, actually, when you look at the front cover design. But when you actually zoom in closer, you see the above the image caption, the title of the book is nestled in. And then you open the book, you see another play in image caption, so you're just like, okay, this is a lot of photographs, right? Um, but then when you get to the middle of the book, you see you come across the actual cover of the book, um, printed on different paper stock, with very special treatment to type, and following that you see the TOC and, you know, and the list of all the photographers grouped together by theme. So when, this, when you come across this kind of moment in a book, you know, one, like, you, you realize, oh, you shouldn't really take these things for granted, but actually, this was the intent of the designer, 
um, to act, they, they did these things because they wanted to amplify the reader's attention to all the other details of the book that normally people would take for granted. Uh, so that was really nice. And moving on to another example, Project Vitra. This is one of my favorite books, um, not only for design, but actually content. Um, it's, um, you know, Vitra is another furniture brand based in Europe. And um, this is a very comprehensive book about, you know, this brand history, the designers, the products associated with it. And uh, what's also nice about this book is it's designed and edited by the same person. So um, Cornell Winlin is a British graphic designer. And it actually shows that he edited this with the chairman of Vitra, Rolf Belbaum. Um, so then all this throughout the book, in terms of like the chapter pages and uh, the COC, it's treated in the same, um, oh wait, before I get to the part, when, when you open the book, you see an index of all the designers' names and the brands and products and keywords listed. So this is, you know, stepping back a little bit. The reason why I like this book is that um, it's just a lot of verbiage and big type. And when you see things like this, it just, it gives you the impression that the editor is sort of thinking out loud and it feels more accessible, approachable. Um, and so when you see the TOC on the left side, so that's the main TOC with all the big sections. And then when you get to the section, they actually show you like a sub TOC. And then when you get deep, deeper into the uh, respective chapters, they have more lists or that sort of act like an index of keywords that they mentioned in the chapters. So um, I just thought that this, when I saw this book, it's just extremely transparent in a way and thoughtful and um, the content was also really good too. So, and then another example of um, sort of this uh, transparency and the immediacy of the TOC uh, with this older uh, cover design from Tate, etc., also designed by Tate uh, Cornell Winlin. Um, I think Ben also showed examples of covers where they are just immediate and direct and show the TOC on the front cover design. And um, you know, this means that they might be more economical with space, who knows, but this kind, this just, just, it just gives you the impression that they're more intellectual about like conversation. And TOC designs can be much more, like it can be an opportunity for bigger typographic moments. I found this book on office design um, at the Argozi bookstore in the Upper East Side. And, you know, it just, I just really like these big, you know, chapter numbers and then the list of all, you know, the content um, mentioned in those chapters. So it's a bit old school type, but, you know, it's got clear visual hierarchy. And then this um, design, uh, this chapter uh, example from Kaleidoscope Magazine designed by OKRM is you can choose to, you know, avoid convention with TOCs and, um, you know, kind of play with words. So in this case, they have like, uh, summary text like that looks like quotes and big title cards and then you deprioritize the other information like the author name and the page number. So just like summarizing what this means for us, you know, TOC is a way to just organize the content but it, once you have all of this organized depending on the typology in which you want to organize the information and um, whether you have higher level groupings or typologies, this gives you, it lays the groundwork for you to um, maybe get inspired of what you can do conceptually once you have all this information. So that's why a TOC is important and it's um, as you know, the reminder that we shouldn't take it for granted. So it's, it's a core part of the editing process. Um, so next though, this leads us to talk about the sequence of the book um, and how it's important to, you know, have a sense of rhythm and a good ones to you know, have the reader's attention. And I'll show you more examples of books that have very creative approaches to sequencing content. Um, all of you probably know this book, SMLXL by uh, um, Fo Ome, designed by Bruce Ma. And um, this book, as you probably know, it's over 1,300 pages. It weighs almost seven pounds. The book is extra, extra large. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, and the way they sequence their content, um, their projects or essays is by scale, from small, medium, to large to extra large. Um, I actually didn't know that until recently. But because when you experience the book, as you probably feel yourselves, there's no sense of system or like even wayfinding in the book. It's so massive and it's meant to get you lost in the book. There's no consistency in the type treatment with these chapter openers. There are no 
people mulch out the openers, I think. Um, but they just mix like a whole bunch of images, drawings, um, essays, travel logs, everything. And uh, it really feels like an architectural odyssey. Um, and I think that's the intent, to make the reader um, uh, have this imaginative experience and be inspired about what uh, was important to Rem Kohlhaas in, this, uh, in articulating the, um, his architectural practice in the context of you know, the global, the explosion of the global market economy and all the you know, social, political, cultural factors happening at that time. Um, another example with you know, an interesting sequencing approach is Perspective 35, designed by Sogi and Min. Um, Perspecta is the, the student edited journal from Yale University. And this uh, book, what's interesting is that it, you know, it just has you know, two formats of paper. And the main sort of formal, uh, well-polished academic essays are printed on these white sheets. And then the more casual, uh, sketch-like briefs are printed on these blue sheets. And um, these blue sheets occur every 16 pages throughout the book regardless of the flow of the content. Um, so it creates, a, in a way, a consistent rhythm. The design of the text on the blue sheets um, just sort of change depending on what the content is. So it's meant to sort of like clash against you know, the typography on the white pages. John Paulson is um, this book, Spectrum, is another interesting example of a clear concept of sequencing. Um, you know, as Many of you might know he's, a, he's known for minimalist architecture, so one might not typically associate his body of work with color. But he is actually, um, I don't know if you've seen his photographs on his Instagram page, but he's very skillful as a photographer and takes really beautiful photographs of textures, details, materials um, from his environment. And um, he, I think those photographs inspire his body of work as well. So it made sense to you know, sequence all his photos by color on a color spectrum. Um, you know, very simple book design layout, but a really strong concept for the sequence of sequencing this content. Um, yeah, so the book progresses from like yellow to reds to purples to blues and greens. And then the last example I want to show with this particular chapter is this old uh, 1972 guide to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I I, I really like just like floor plans and maps and color in general, so I think I'm just showing this, you this out of personal bias. But this is, uh, you know, they, when you open it, they show you maps of the different floors in the museum, and then they color code the rooms based on the collection. And so then if you go to the second floor, they show you, you know, other rooms. And they have these like nice colors associated with these different collections, like music instruments, pink, American wing, blue, far eastern eyes would be green. And then when you go into the book, all of these sections, they're like discrete chapters based on collection. And then the chapter pages are printed in the respective colors as they were coded on the map. And then they actually open as gatefolds, so you, they, you get a more detailed view of that particular room in the museum. And then they have all this, like, these icons and symbols um, designated to each chapter. So this was just like a nice um, color book screen. And it's surprising because the cover of this book is red and um, you wouldn't know that they use so much color in the book unless you opened it. So what does that mean for us? It means that you know, with, when it comes to content, you can be very creative and conceptual with the way you sequence your content. You could organize it by time, whether it's chronology in terms of you know, like when something was made or the duration of something. You can organize project by space, um, the location geographically, or proximity in terms of this, you know, how far it is from a central location. Or this is the most common way of approaching it, I guess, is by theme, which you can decide what that theme is. It could be by project or program, uh, material, or any dimension in which you want to talk about your work, like cultural, social, environmental, and the status of whether the project was built or not. Um, and I mean, this is just like a loose list, so you can define it however you want. You can, uh, uh, organize your projects by scale, which is the, you know, what OMA did with SML extra large. And um, yeah, and you can, and anything that can be put on a scale, essentially, like the size or like cost. And then finally, you can organize things by spectrum, um, like the Dawn Parson example with color, um, temperature, complexity of something. Again, anything that can be put on a spectrum in terms of degrees of intensity. Um, and so next I'll talk to you about images and text, and this is the most important part of the book editing process. 
And I'm going to start by talking about images. And, um, and I'll show you more. Uh, I, the reason why I'm showing a lot more examples with images is that I think I'm, you know, I know that you have to deal with a lot of images yourselves with your work. Um, and I want to show you actually two books that focus a lot on image pairings. Um, and I feel like laying out two images on a spread is for some reason really hard, like harder than laying out one image versus more than three or more images. And the reason is that um, I've come to experience this myself, but and maybe you don't feel this way, but when you see two images in a spread, you tend to make an association with each other. And I think a lot of people do. So you have to be very thoughtful and careful about which two images you decide to put on a spread. Um, and I want to share this example with you. It's a book called Disobedient Bodies, um, designed by OKRM for an exhibition that was curated by uh, Jonathan Anderson at the Hepworth Greek Field. Um, and the exhibition is basically, it's, a, it's about the, figure, the human figure um, in the world of art and fashion. So th in that exhibition, there were you know, sculptural works by a lot of famous artists like John Arp, Henry Moore, Alberto Giacometti, um, Barbara Hepworth herself. And then they were um, situated in those, in those spaces as well. So fashion designs by prominent designers like um, Helmut Lang, Christian Dior, Issey Miyake, Ray Kawabuko. And so um, that was the exhibition. And, but this book uh, catalog uh, is designed to be an alternative interpretation of the exhibition. And so it's about like 142 pages, and it's not bound in a particular way. It's not stapled or you know, glued together. It's just folded in half, um, held together by a rubber band. And, and the pages are interweaved with photography by Jamie Hawksworth. But what I, the reason why I love this book is the images are so expertly paired together to really um, you know, accentuate your appreciation for the human figure. And you know, the pairings might be by color or form, sense of gesture, movement, proportion. And then, you know, because of the way this book is constructed and uh, folded together, you see, um, in the interweek pages, you see images in new ways. Um, and I'm going to kind of pause here to talk about image cropping. And, um, and it, I think this comes from, you know, maybe some of you already know how important it is that to crop an image and how much of a difference it can make. But having worked on some fashion projects in the last couple of years, cropping in fashion and beauty is everything. Like little, I mean, so the next time you see a fashion campaign or picture, really look at where they cut off the head or the feet. Or, and it's, there's, um, it's an intense process. And so I want to show you some examples. There's the statue of David. Um, so the, you know, the right, the left example is you know, how you would normally crop it, like full body. Uh, but the reason why cropping is important is maybe you have this image where you really want to hone the reader's attention on a specific part of the image. So maybe all that other excess stuff in the image doesn't really matter. So it's worth cropping in. So for instance, if I want to just focus the reader, the viewer's gaze on his upper body, I can crop it, you know, the legs out, or go farther into the torso, or the detail of the face, or I focus on the lower body, more torso detail, hand detail, or the leg detail. So. Um, so even when you have a bad image, for instance, like cropping can make all the difference. Photoshopping can make a difference, but cropping can also make a big difference. So it's worth trying out. Um, so I wanna sh then I want to follow up with this example um, called The Art of Color for um, The House of Dior. And it's basically a book about the history of color and style and makeup at The House of Dior. And, and this book is full of image pairings. Um, just to ex uh, exemplify how different pieces of art by artists uh, inspire the work at the House of Dior. So um, again, cropping played a, played a huge role in presenting these images, along with the selection of the images on the right side. So just showing you these, um, again, how you are likely to make these associations, in this case with color, uh, form, And then this last bit, really nice color strips. Um, and then moving on to image layout. So again, Ben went really in depth with you know, the different ways you can lay out text and images on um, a book spread. But 
so my emphasis will be actually more on images again this time. Uh, so it's one thing to have one image on a spread, right? Uh, this will mean that this image is really significant or meaningful to you in the context of this book, or um, it's just a beautiful image. So it, it's worth thinking about, you know, the image that you choose to devote a whole spread to, right? Versus having two images on a spread, again, um, people may might uh, uh, will make those associations. So which two images will you put on the spread? Is it going to be about a conceptual connection or about formal association? And then this example on the bottom from Project of Japan, um, that one's packed with a lot of text uh, images. So in that case, like Im the image captions really help the reader understand you know, the meaning behind all of these images. And then just showing you examples of spreads with three or more images. Um, the first example here is from Alvaro Cesar's A Pull in the Sea. And it's a short book, but what I really liked about this is um, the designer cropped and placed these images in, in a way that would control the viewer's gaze across the spread, you know, from, from one corner to the next. Um, and then if you have like sort of more complex, you know, composition of images, again, like in the Project of Pen example, all these image captions just help sort of, you know, um, help the, the eye flow across the page. Different ways of uh, laying out images include like layering them to create a certain, like a jagged effect, um, as shown in this example from Stealing Beauty. Or you could be completely linear in the way you lay out your images. Um, this is uh, spread is from the uh, office of Kirsten Gears and David Van Severin. They have three books, like three volumes, um, that are basically their, you know, their portfolio of their works. But um, I actually recommend these books for references for portfolio design because it's actually very uh, well organized and um, super linear and clear. And they have, they also have very beautiful documentation of their work. But anyway, in this in this spread, you have three different images of the same building, and um, you know they have a lot of white space. So that's just something to consider, like how much white space will you have around your images because White space means that you treat the images with, um, they, uh, you know, they seem a little bit more precious. Whereas if you have the images full bleed like this example, um, the whole experience uh, feels a little bit different. The, it's a little bit more immersive. Um, it feels more immediate in a way. Having more white space has a very different effect. So I will show you this monograph from David Chipfield Architects designed by John Morgan. And, um, you know, this is also very sort of, um, in terms of graphic design style, it's very quiet and modest. Um, but I want to share this example with you because there is actually a diversity of you know layout approaches in terms of uh, the number of images he may put on a spread. And this is just a spread in terms of how project is introduced. So there's just like two columns of um, project description. It's super simple and straightforward, but. Um, when you go inside the book, it's just worth noting uh, this, you know, is a good example of the um, image editing process for, you know, showing a whole, you know, a whole like monographs worth of body of work, right? So you can make uh, really nicely drawn um, building drawings, like full, treat them, you know, give them a whole spread in the book to really give it more gravity. And if you have two uh, drawings of the same building, it's worth considering uh, whether they might be redundant. So in this case, one is treated in color and shown you know, from the first point perspective, and then the other is shown at an angle in black and white. So they feel like different images, but they're actually the same building. And it's worth noting that sense of um, sort of diversity even when you're talking about the same project. Uh, model photos, you can choose just one and make it look like a really beautiful, handsome picture, uh, as opposed to showing uh, you know, 20 model photos. And then you can think about visual hierarchy. And here you have two big images and a smaller image um, alongside text and captions. And then here you have even more elements on the spread, drawings, historical photographs, um, a more recent photograph of the project. And so I thought that this was also, again, a, different, a good example of integrating diversity and talking about the same project. And oftentimes I think um, it's easy to feel repetitive and redundant when talking about your work by showing, cramming in all the, you know, the floor plans, the models or the photographs, and it's, 
worthwhile to edit out, you know, all of that down to the most essential and um, sort of meaningful drawings or, or images. Um, this book is also one of my favorite books designed by Yoon and the team at 2x4. Um, it's for a Fundación de Prada and it's called Ca Corna de la Regina. And it was, it's a book basically about, you know, the activities and um, the art at this 18th century palazzo in Venice, Italy. Uh, I'm just going to show you one spread from this book, and this is my favorite part of the book. This is a little bit arbitrary, but I actually just really like these white floor plans, this blue paper, um, and they actually work as chapter dividers. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are, I think there are four sections in this book, and this page repeats itself um, with the beginning of each chapter. And then um, these different rooms, on, depending on the floors, are highlighted in a sky blue color to um, make a connection between the content mentioned in the book and the maps and the location in the, um, the building. Poetsi Vega, uh, this book is also designed by John Morgan. And I'm showing you these examples because they have really, also really beautiful documentation of, and representation of their work. Um, but this book shows a really nice consistency in the way they present line drawings and um, plans. Um, in this case, just like black and white uh, planned, and then all the sort of surrounding areas and blocks, you know, covered in black ink. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about images, um, I just want to pause here to talk about the importance of image captions. And um, again, it's something that maybe some of us take for granted. But when you actually see an image with no caption, um, you're kind of leading, leaving the viewer up to guess what you know, the image is about. If it is your intent to leave the interpretation of the image up to the viewer, then um, you can do away with the caption. But in your case, if it is really important for you to, to communicate what the significance of the image is, then it's worthwhile having that caption. So you could have a short caption, um, as shown in the example in the middle, or you could have a more descriptive sentence that explains the thought behind um, the, the image itself. So um, the other thing to note is that if you have a certain caption style in your book, it's important to be consistent. Um, and then this is just a spread from, I mean, sorry, a screenshot of what that particular project from Herzog and Demiron. It's a project page from their website. Uh, also, it's worthwhile looking at these websites of different architectural practices to see how they talk about their work and, um, and look out for any patterns that might inspire you and in how you talk about your projects. So, um, I mean, I think the pretty standard approach is to have a project title, uh, list the location, the dates, and then have a short description. Uh, but the key really is to be consistent, right, in terms of the order of the content and the style in which all of this is written. Um, I'm going to follow up with a few more examples for this. And um, this book, uh, I believe it's the first edition of this, but for the architect Valeria Ogiati, and it's a really, um, it's a really nice object because all these uh, pages are printed on cardstock paper, but they're dub uh, double mounted, and each page has a plate devoted to it. Um, what's nice about this is that uh, this essay by Mario Carpo um, runs across the entire book on the bottom. So it looks like a giant caption. So regardless of where you are in the book, you'll see this essay text from Mario Carpo, and it feels like a global narrative and um, you know, at glance, at, you know, from a distance, it just looks like, you know, an enormous image caption when it's actually an essay. Um, the actual image captions are nestled above that text below the image. Um, but this book is also really wonderful as an object, too. Um, and then this recent uh, monograph from Herzog and Dimion. Um, this is sort of like the polar opposite of most typical architectural monographs. So this is a book called, you know, One to 500. And basically it just shows you uh, the first 500 projects. But this went through an extreme editing process where they would show just one image per project. So each spread would just show four projects. Um, so it meant, so that's a lot of pressure to boil down, you know, an, um, what might be a more complex project down to just one image. And then each of these images have consistent ways of treating them with image captions, um, a number, name, location, and the dates. And then Laura showed this example earlier with pre-Columbian art. 
in New York, this catalog, um, not only is it nice in terms of like the, the way they treat the book as a, um, in terms of paper format and the materiality, but um, in, I just want to zoom in again with these image captions. You have these black and white images, these artifacts, and then very consistent treatment of um, the captions, but nestled next to the captions is that the, the ruler for scale measurement. So um, this just to really emphasize that you can be um, more thoughtful and creative with it, and caption is a very detailed element, and I like what Laura said about treating her caption the same size as her text uh, copy with one of her projects to um, communicate uh, sort of a designer's intent. And so the detail is the work, right? Um, next, I want to talk to you about tone and character. So once you figure it out, you know, um, this actually is not, this is, all of this is not meant to be a linear process in terms of the work process, but tone and character might be something you think about in the beginning of a project. Uh, it's important because uh, it's sort of the impression that you want to leave um, on a reader, and it's, it's essentially like establishing a persona. Um, and ev everything that you do with the book design, whether it's choosing a typeface to um, your layout design to the images, the content of the images, um, the quality of the text, the paper stock you choose, the binding, the, the book size, all of that uh, contributes to a sense of tone and character. And um, I want to show you two, two books that couldn't be more different from each other, um, not only in terms of the visual of the book, but the architects for which they're designed for. And um, the book on the, on the left is Never Modern, designed by John Morgan uh, for 6A Architects. And the book on the right is the Archie comic book for Bianca Ingo's group called Yes Is More. So when you look at these, they look really different, right? Never Modern has more white space. Um, it just seems more modest. It's in this serif typography. Uh, it's simple and then it's, you know, has this quiet feeling. Yes Is More is you know, it's more dark. There's more black ink on it. Um, the, the type is this comic book style uh, treatment, and it's just busy and it just, it just feels <laughs> ominous, right? And when you open the book, they also look and feel very different, right? On the, on the left side with uh, Never Modern, you have uh, this essay text by Irene Scalbert that talks about you know, the uh, perspective of 6 day architects and their approach to architecture, but it's in typeset in this big serif typography with a lot of white space, um, and all the images are in black and white. And then on, um, in contrast to that, with the, the Yes Is More example, there are a lot more images, mo for the most part, packed into each spread. And then all the text is in this speech bubble, so it's meant to feel like a comic book. And um, you know, they just couldn't be more different from each other in terms of the style and like, the look and the aesthetic. Uh, what's ironic about this is that I think when I look at these two books and you read about it a little bit, the intent is actually the same. They both want to seem approachable, accessible, uh, and want to make a connection with the viewers. So, um, so what does this mean? It, you know, it's important to sort of verbalize in your head what those qualities are that you want to go for, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's all about where you want to be on the spectrum, right? So you could choose to be quiet versus loud, soft, hard, simple, complex, traditional, modern, Minimal, maximal, academic, commercial, oh sorry, uh, pretty, ugly, playful, serious, slow, fast, easygoing, intense, economical, luxurious, casual, formal, rough, refined, intimate, cool, and then this list can just go on, right? Um, so, like I said, this is something that you can really think about in the beginning of the book design process too. And then finally, I will uh, you know, wrap up by talking about one of the other projects that I worked on. Um, and once you've figured out all the details, I think Yoon actually just said this really well earlier before, but once you've figured out all the details, like the, you know, the technical parts like the paper stock or like your typography and all, et cetera, all of that, um, once you've made that book, it really can transcend what it's, you know, the actual book itself, the meaning and the value that it holds for people who may come across your book later on. Um, so I want to talk to you about this book project that I worked on with Martha McGill, who is my classmate at Yale. And uh, we worked with three editors for this project, um, AJ, Violet, and Russell. And um, perspective, like I said earlier, is 
uh, America's oldest student edited journal from Yale University. And because of school tradition, the way it's done, it's actually a three year long uh, project process. And before I go into detail, I want to talk, show you this overview of some covers that preceded our uh, Prospecta. So we worked on Prospecta 49, which came out in 2016. And, um, and it's funny because I'm, you know, um, Ben and Law, I'm sure, and you and Jill, you know, when you work on a book, the publisher might ask for the cover design very early in the process, even before you've designed it. So in the beginning, we look at the covers uh, um, just to get a sense of what's been done before. Um, but the, reason, the real reason why I'm showing you this slide is that uh, typically with prospectus, they have like one word uh, titles like money, amnesia, agency, taboo, uh, monster, uh, famous building codes, grand tour, etc. And um, all of these words, or most of them, have very strong visual associations uh, tied to the words. So if you think of money, you know, you think of coins or dollar bills or hundred dollar bills, whatever. Monsters is, you know, again, another clear visual association. Um, ours, the, the title was called Quote, and uh, we were, you know, we don't really have a visual association with Quote. It's more verbal. Um, so, you know, it was, uh, on, we, the editor's statement, which is crafted in the very beginning of the process, was very clear, but, you know, the, it was actually a pretty complex subject matter for us, um, at the, especially at the beginning when we had no content uh, to work with in the beginning. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna read out a really short editor's, a condensed editor's statement for a quote, and it is an exploration of quotation, appropriation, and plagiarism arguing that quotation and associated operations are ubiquitous, intentional, and vital in architecture. Yeah, so that's a lot of like words packed in, and, and you know, you part, I still don't know what it means. So I'll show you examples of um, what the editors meant by quote by showing you um, these things that we dis discussed in the beginning of the editorial process. Uh, quote, as we all know it, is you know, words paraphrase, like words written by another person. So when you write essays you qu and you quote someone, uh, you put that, those sentences in between quotation marks, right? So that's the way we understand what a quote is. Um, but the act of quotation can mean many different things. Um, in this case, it can mean plagiarism. So um, maybe many of you know about this project, but the building on the left is this building designed by Zaha Hadid. It's called Wang Ying Soho. It's a multi-use complex uh, built in Beijing. Um, it was controversial because at literally exactly the same time, the building on the right was going up in the city of Chongqing. And so, um, and I believe it may have been completed faster, like uh, earlier than the Zaha Hadid one. But it's, uh, the building on the right is called uh, Meikon 22nd Century. Um, by this developer. And so people at Zaha Hadid were ready to file a lawsuit, and um, you know, it, it was highly suspected that the developer basically pirated, stole the digital files from Zaha Hadid. And so I don't know the full details of the lawsuit, but um, going into that kind of process would delay the construction process. So, um, and I think I read this recently, but the developer wrote <laughs> on their site, uh, basically denying that they plagiarized and said, we don't mean to copy, we only mean to surpass, which is ridiculous, um, but the buildings are identical. Um, and it's, it's a notorious case, unfortunately. Quotation happens a lot in fashion, and in other fields, creative fields as well, but um, a lot in fashion. And the building, the, sorry, the code on the right is from uh, Celine's, uh, Phoebe Philo Celine collection from fall 2013. And um, it's this gray coat with, you know, knotted sleeves. And when it came out, um, this fashion writer pointed out, hey, there was this, uh, you know, remarkable similarity to Jeffrey Bean's coat back from back in 2004. So um, people reached out to the team at Jeffrey Bean. So Jeffrey Bean had already passed away by the time this coat from Celine had come out. Um, but the representatives at that fashion house were basically like, they were not surprised and they said, you know, Jeffrey, the late designer, he's inspired many designers who came after him. So it was seen in the light of homage and not plagiarism. 
So it's a good form of quotation. Um, flattery, is, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, they say. The best form of quotation, as we understand, um, is when you take uh, not the visual component of something, but the ideals and the ideas in some a body of work or, or, you know, or something and uh, translate it into something completely new. So look, you know, many architects were inspired by the Parthenon and you know, it's very well known that Le Corbusier was also very inspired by the classical ideas of the Parthenon in Athens. Um, so there were associations made with his La Savoie uh, building in um, France and um, the Parthenon. And then to us, you know, with a lot of technological tools at our disposal, um, quotation can really mean replicating things uh, really easily with, you know, the um, invention of 3D scanning, 3D printing, SketchUp, all these software programs that allow us to really quickly make things um, and mimic things. So that's the, that gives you a better sense of what quotation uh, meant in the, in the context of this issue. Uh, this is just an overview of all the content that we have to deal with. So in the, like I said in the beginning, we get this TOC or list of all the essays that we will deal with. Um, it's a three year long process. So that means most of that time is spent um, the, with, the, with the editors reaching out to different contributors for Perspecta. Um, the design itself doesn't actually take three years. And um, so the challenge for Martha and myself, as we were working on this book, um, was how do you come up with a design concept approach when you don't really have the essays or the content yet, and, and you're just working with the um, concept and sort of the list of uh, you know, essays and uh, authors that you'll be working with later on. Um, but as I showed you through the examples, so quote, quote is not just you know, a textual thing, but it can you know, relate to the world of images as well. So our challenge was to convey the concept of quote through the way we treat text and images in the book um, con and conceptually, right? So I wanna talk to you about how we chose our typefaces in this book and we chose two. One was Neuhaus Grotesque and the other was Optimal Nova. Um, the reason why we chose those two typefaces is, um, well, after doing a, you know, a really um, kind of, um, an exploration of all these different possible sensor, you know, classical ones that we could work with, we landed in Neuhaus Grotesque, and we just knew we wanted to work with revival fonts. A lot of fonts actually are revival fonts, technically speaking, because, for instance, you know, um, with the computer, a lot of them had to be digitized, so that became an opportunity for type designers to work on spacing and uh, redrawing these things uh, so that they're appropriate for screens and printing in today's world, so. Um, but anyway, just a brief story about Helvetica and Neuhaus Grotesque. Uh, Neuhaus Grotesque is a revival of Helvetica. Helvetica used to be called Neuhaus Grotesque. Um, back in the 1950s, um, Edward Hoffman of Haas Type Foundry in Switzerland uh, needed to come up with a grotesque typeface that would compete well with Occident's Grotesque at the time. Occident's Grotesque was sort of the adored um, sensor of typeface in uh, Swiss graphic design at the time. So he asked Max Meidinger, who's the designer in the far left corner, uh, to come up with the new grotesque typeface. And he drew what became Helvetica. It was Neuhaus Grotesque. They changed the name to Helvetica because I believe it was for marketing reasons. Helvetica means the Swiss. And, um, but you know, of course with changes in printing uh, processes from metal to fo uh, linotype photo setting, uh, that original design for Neuhaus Grotesque underwent a lot of changes and compromises. So in the early 2000s, um, Christian Schwartz was commissioned to revive Neuhaus Grotesque or Helvetica. So the Neuhaus Grotesque you see today is closer to the original designs for Helvetica. So um, you'll see differences if you look really closely. But anyway, so we chose Neuhaus Grotesque over Helvetica um, as a revival typeface. And then the other typeface we chose was Optima Nova. Optima was designed by a German type, uh, type designer named Hermann Zaff. And um, he, in 1950, he also this was all designed around the same time, both Neuhaus Grotesque and Optima. But anyway, in 1950, Hermann Zaff went to Florence for the first time on holiday. And then he went into this 
um, uh, cemetery and he saw these uh, classical Roman letterings, uh, stone carved in the cemetery and he really liked them uh, in the way that it's a humanist uh, typeface. So the ends of the letters don't quite become served and he really liked that quality. So he made sketches on a thousand lira note, went back to Germany with his mom and he basically developed this typeface over the course of the next decade or so. But, but again, with technological changes, um, it was necessary for Optima to be revived to its original form. Um, so Akira Kobayashi and Herman Zaff worked together to come up with Optima Nova. So those were our two typefaces for this project. And we had some restrictions. For instance, the book size had to be 9 by 12, right? And um, this is not something I uh, will not go into detail now, but um, Martha and I just decided to split the, group, the book grid system into six columns. So it would allow for a lot more flexibility in laying out different kinds of content throughout different chapters. And we really wanted tight margins. Uh, this is just random. We just wanted tight margins. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is that um, something I discovered, and I, I think it depends on the printer that you work with, but printing a thick book with a lot of pages can sometimes cost more than printing full color, right? So we want to be economical with space. And the other thing to note is that um, we did have a printing budget limit, right? So it, we knew it would be expensive to print in full color, so we decided to treat all our images in black and white. This is just to show you a spread where, of how we utilized the six column grid system. And then the dotted line that you see at the top is our hang line. Um, and we used the six column grid in a number of different ways throughout the whole book but it allows for a lot more flexibility. And because the book is called Quote, we, we actually just, you know, instead of a standard uh, chapter opener where we start with the, the title of the article and the author's name, we actually prefaced each essay with um, a compelling quote um, that we thought was interesting and then typeset that in Optima Nova, put them in big quotation marks, and then pair them with a the footnote symbol. So actually, no high school task and Optima Nova don't, they don't have a ton of uh, footnote symbols in the glyph system, so we went to other typefaces and got uh, footnote symbols from them. So, for, you know, as shown here. And then, um, just, just to show you a close-up of the quote pages. And we, paper one, we were able to get one Pantone color, mint green, which is actually also random. So I'm just saying some things can be random. <laughs> like most things can be thoughtful, but some things can be random. Um, but I actually, I can rationalize this uh, decision making process, but that's for another time. Um, this is showing you overview of all the essays uh, with this mint Pantone green color treatment and the quotes um, and the footnote symbols. And then when you go past the quote page, you will get uh, the re repeat of that footnote symbol on a smaller scale and then the beginning of the essays. Um, and then I believe we had a total of four different type sizes for the entire book. And any text that was uh, quoted by, you know, words by somebody else, we treated in a light, you know, a gray color. So these were all these moves that we made to um, make that connection, like as from the design point with the uh, book title and the concept quote. So when it came to images, that was a whole not a different set of challenges of how we lay out the images that would convey the concept of quote and quotation. And this is an image that was actually shown in the book. It's the exhibition wall from um, a late 1970s exhibition on architecture from MoMA. And it was controversial because basically, I believe the exhibition was called Transformation in Modern Architecture. What the curator did was just put lots of images of similar looking buildings on the wall. So it was, you know, um, controversial in, in its statement saying that architecture is, has, all, all the buildings are looking the same. And so what, you know, visually it's kind of cool to look at and Martha and I were like, it would be really cool to just have lots and lots and lots of similar looking images throughout the book, right? And again, when you are, when you begin to design or come up with concepts for a book before you even have the content, it's kind of tricky because you don't, you're not really responding to the content. You're just kind of fantasizing in, uh, about the kind of visuals you want to make as a designer. We also fantasize about having a lot of side-by-sides 
Um, but the editors try to talk us down every time we try to propose that idea. And, but as I showed you with those examples of quotation, what they mean, it could mean homage, plagiarism, etc. cetera. Um, the term quote in quotation is actually much more nuanced and complex. So it wouldn't make sense to have this one big gesture across the whole book in terms of image treatment. So really what we were doing was responding to each essay and the argument at hand and the way they talk about quotation. Um, and we would lay out the images based on that concept or the argument. So there are different things that we could do you know, with images that would metaphor metaphorically connect to the idea of quotation. You could reprint images. You could show the side by side. You can show an archive of images. You can show repetition of images or a timeline. You can also frame these various images or you can imitate a visual style or image treatment. You can cut out images and you can also copy or uh, scan images. Um, and then I'll just show you how we actually did that in some of these threads. So this was the reprint of an essay from an older issue of Perspecta that the editors chose to include. And then this is a side-by-side -side of um, you know, art or artifacts uh, replicated through 3D scanning, uh, 3D printing. Here we show the archives from other books. We show a bunch of um, similar looking images, like a uh, repetition of similar looking buildings from Russia. Or we could show um, a timeline of images. This essay was about you know, the influence of the Parthenon throughout time and how there were many similar looking Parthenons in different parts of the world. You could also frame these images. And then this was the, I, um, this thing we made in imitation of Robert McSong's graphic design style. Uh, and, sorry, collaging style. And it was something that was requested by the author of that article, who was um, Thomas Weaver, he's the editor of AA Files. You could also uh, show cutouts of these different images, where you can copy or scan these images. So this was a proposal for the Young Architecture Architects Program proposal for PS1 MoMA. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. And then I want to end by showing you this quote from the last essay in this book. And I, I want to read it because I think it's, um, I'll end with the quote because it's talking about quote, but uh, it's, I think, pretty compelling. It's just basically, you know, the argument at hand here, and, and in a way, I think it's the conclusion of the whole book, is that quotation is necessary and it can be helpful. So in architecture, as in life, quotation is really all that matters and no transcendental individualism can ever replace the richness of a world full of weapons, nuance, and illusion. Yeah, stack of books. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.